Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming out. And on behalf of the, I'm the, Nathan Kernan, the president of the Milton Resnick and Pat Pasloff Foundation. And on behalf of the foundation and the Elizabeth Harris Gallery, I'd like to welcome you all to this panel on Pat Pasloff's paintings from the 1950s. I'm just going to introduce the panel, and then I'm going to sit down. In the middle is Raphael Rubinstein, who will, who will um, moderate. Raphael Rubinstein is a poet, art critic, and independent curator. His most recent book, The Miraculous, published this year by Paper Monument, is a series of prose narratives which has been published also in French translation. His other books include a selection of his art criticism, Polychrome Profusion, Selected Art Criticism 1990 to 2002, published in 2004, several poetry volumes including The Afterglow of Minor Pop Masterpieces, 2007, and The Basement of the Café Rilke, 1996. He edited the anthology Critical Mess, Art Critics on the State of Their Practice, 2006, and Flammarion has just published his monograph on Shirley Jaffe. From 1997 to 2007, Rubinstein was the senior editor at Art in America, where he continues to be a contributing editor. He is professor of critical studies at the University of Houston School of Art. In 2002, he was named a Chevalier in the Order of Arts and Letters by the French government. He also puts out a great blog, The Silo, which won a Creative Capital Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. Jeffrey Dorfman, to his left, is a painter, writer, and musician. Since 2007, he has been represented by the Ober Gallery in Kent, Connecticut, and in the 1980s, he showed in New York with Oscarson Hood. He received the Henry Ward Ranger Prize for painting from the National Academy of Design in 2006. A retrospective exhibition of his work was held at Ryder University in New Jersey in 2013. He is an associate professor of art at the College of Staten Island. Dorfman's book, Out of the Picture, Milton Resnick and the New York School, begun in 1978 with an individual fellowship grant from the National Endowment for the Arts, was published by Midmarch Press in 2004 and is an invaluable resource for information on the artist and his circle. He met Pat Pasloff in 1974 and was a close friend until her death. Dorfman is a trustee of the Milton Resnick and Pat Pasloff Foundation and is working on a biography of Resnick. Louise Fishman, at the head of the table, is one, one head of the table, is one of the foremost abstract expressionist painters working today. She earned a BFA from the Tyler School of Art and an MFA from the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. She has had more than 40 solo exhibitions and participated in countless group shows, including three Whitney Biennials in 1965, 1974, and this last one in 2014. She is the recipient of many awards, including several grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, a Guggenheim Fellowship in Painting, an Adolf and Esther Gottlieb Foundation Award, and a CAPS grant. She has been a fellow at the McDowell Colony and received an Arts Award from the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters in 2013. Museums owning her work include the Metropolitan Museum, the Jewish Museum, the Carnegie Institute, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Fogg Museum, and the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth. Michael Walls, here at the other end, is an independent curator and art writer focusing on American contemporary painting. He opened his first gallery, the Michael Walls Gallery, in San Francisco in 1967 and has been continuously involved with curating exhibitions, either as the director, director of commercial galleries or at public institutions for the past 47 years. He was for two years director of the Virginia Commonwealth University Art Gallery, where he mounted some 30 shows, including an Alfred Jensen retrospective. He feels particularly privileged to have been involved over many years with both commercial galleries and public institutions. Finally, Karen Wilkin is an independent curator and critic specializing in 20th century modernism. 
educated at Barnard College and Columbia University. She's the author of monographs on Stuart Davis, David Smith, Anthony Caro, Kenneth Noland, Helen Frankenthaler, Giorgio Morandi, and Hans Hoffman, among others, and has organized exhibitions of their work internationally. She is contributing editor for art for the Hudson Review and a regular contributor to the New Criterion and the Wall Street Journal. She teaches in the New York Studio School's MFA program. Wilkins' friendship with Pasloff beginning in about 2000 was a form informed by their shared backgrounds in dance. We probably talked as much about dance as we did painting, she has said. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, and thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, I'd like to first just say a few words about this show. Uh, it's an exhibition that uh, tracks uh, Pat Pasloff's work uh, throughout the 1950s. She had studied at Black Mountain College, uh, in, uh, and she'd been living and grew up in New York prior to that, spent some time at Black Mountain studying with Willem de Kooning, and then came back to New York on the same train as de Kooning, as the story goes, at the age of 20 and began to paint and immersed herself into the uh, New York art world. She talks about how um, she felt that there were all of these conversations that had been going on in some cases since the 1930s among artists. And she likened it to a chess game that an artist had made a move or said something that then other painters, other sculptors would come back to years later. And she felt, I guess, stimulated by this immersion in, in this uh, uh, very vibrant established community. She was also struck by how many of the artists at the time were immigrants. There were Italians, uh, Egyptians, um, Armenians, Greeks. There was it's a very multi-ethnic, multicultural uh, uh, milieu. Uh, also, she noted that most of these uh, artists were self-taught. Not all of them were, but a lot of them were. So um, one of the things that, uh, that I guess characterized her early time in New York and maybe even into the 50s is that a lot of the downtown artists thought that she had studied, since she'd studied with de Kooning at Black Mountain, she continued to study with him, that he was teaching her how to be an abstract painter. And that was, you know, a difficult, that was a, a problem, I think, for some artists, the idea that, that abstraction could, could become, could be taught, rather than something that you developed and evolved in through, into through the struggle. But it turns out that de Kooning was actually, as she said, uh, teaching her, it was like, as if she were at the Rotterdam Art Academy. He was teaching, giving her very kind of rigorous academic training, um, in, particularly in still lives. So I think one of the things that you can see looking at the paintings in the show uh, is this back and forth between figuration and abstraction, between gestural marks and still life compositions which is maybe something that we, the panelists, can, can talk about. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just begin by posing uh, questions to uh, each um, person. And I'd like to start uh, with Jeffrey Dorfman. And Jeffrey, you knew uh, Pat Pasloff for a long time. And I was struck by something you said that you had never seen any of these paintings, that um, although you had often gone to her studio, spent much time with her talking about her work and I assume her history that these paintings were uh, new to you and I wonder um, why if you have an idea of why she didn't uh, bring those out and and even what might she have thought of this show looking back at her work of this period well as to the last issue uh, I can't get in could never get inside her mind even when she was alive. And certainly can't do it now that she's dead. So what she would think of this uh, is, is, would just be speculation. But, uh, but I would say that um, you can take from the fact that these works were not on display and she didn't really pull them out to show you that for him, for her, they were, they were in the past. I mean, they were a long, these paintings are 50 and 60 years old. Um, 
more than 60, some of them. And, um, and for her, our art was, um, like most of us, it's what you're doing now, you know, or what you've just done. Uh, so um, what has released this show is, in, ironically, her, her death. I mean, uh, I, I have no idea whether she would want them out now <laughs> or not. Uh, but now that, you know, when an artist is no longer with us, the, the work becomes a totality. And, uh, and, um, and has to be viewed that way. As a matter of fact, it may interest you to know that we could fill up one of these rooms with work from the late 40s, which we made a curatorial decision not to include work from 48 and 49, which she did uh, when she was working with Bill. And, uh, so we started with 1950 and we kept, kept it strictly deca the decade, you know, it goes from 50 to 59. I don't even think we have something here from 1960. So we, we kept it very limited. So, uh, you know, because whatever. And um, it's not strictly true that I never saw any of these. I mean, I did see Score for a Bird and Crown, I think I saw, but you know, most of it is, 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 is new to me. And, um, and uh, I think that if you had asked her about this show, she would say, I'll oh, show, show what I've just done. You know, I think most of us who are artists would, would have the same attitude, you know. But um, that's my answer. Uh, all right, thanks. Um, uh, Louise, you knew Pat and um, were a supporter of her work for a long time. Uh, you're though also of a, of a different generation. Um, and I wonder what sense you have of um, the challenges she faced as a woman artist in her generation uh, in New York and, and how you think she might have negotiated that, or what, do, or, or your sense of the differences um, in terms of being a woman painter coming out of the fifties? Coming out, uh, yeah. In the 50s. Coming out in, coming out <laughs> in the fifties. Yeah. Well, I, I actually didn't know Pat that well, but I had an unusual sort of. Um, casual friendship with her. And in the beginning, I didn't know her paintings at all because I was um, in, in, when she was teaching at Richmond College, I was taking the ferry out there with her because I taught there too in the Women's Studies program. Uh, I think her experience was probably very different than mine uh, because they had a, uh, a very radical, politically radical um, program uh, in which I was teaching something called uh, Lesbians as Creative People. <laughs> and it was actually the first, it, it was the first uh, women's studies program in the United States. And, I mean, and I guess On Staten anywhere. Island. On Staten Island. All places. Well, what, I, what I found out um, later is that Richmond College was actually Richmond College is a senior college. Staten Island Community College is the first two years. Is that right? I'm not sure. And they combine. It's they one, combine. Oh, it's now not. CUNY. It's one one entity. Well, what CUNY, CUNY did in the '70s was to take all the radicals from all the CUNY universities and throw them out into Staten Island to get rid of them um, because, you know, they were, they were causing so much trouble, revolution, uh, everywhere they were, and, and it was a very smart move, and I think a lot of those radicals didn't really get what was happening because they were on Staten Island, but, and they sort of fought with each other all the time. I'm sorry, this is a sort of a distraction from <coughs> the question. But, um, so Pat, I didn't realize, my memory isn't that great about that period, except for the fights we had during the meetings where the students and the faculty ran the program, decided what courses were gonna be given. I don't remember Pat at that, 
and, but she must have been there because everyone who taught there went to those meetings and so on. Um, but I continued to bump into Pat in, over the course. I mean, I came from Philadelphia, <coughs> so um, my experience was very, very different um, than, than Pat's growing up in Queens, uh, going to school at Queens for a while, and then going to a Black Mountain. I mean, it would never have been an option for me to go to Black Mountain College. You know, it just wasn't in the cards. Uh, uh, I had a very different background, which I won't go into, except that Pat is between me and my mother in terms of generations. My mother was a very important painter in Philadelphia. Um, and I see it in a general, generational way, what um, the connections uh, were. My my um, my strongest impulses about this show have to do with the paintings <clears throat> and what it brings up for me about that moment in the 50s when I was looking at art news magazines and, and seeing photographs of Joan Mitchell and de Kooning and all of them in their studios. And, and I didn't know Pat, but these paintings are so much about that moment. And what it, when I first walked into this show, what hit me was this passion for paint, which I hadn't seen. I mean, it's not very common anymore to have that, this kind of, and, and, and rather brilliant uh, use of paint and brush. And, uh, I mean, I don't know what her background is. I mean, I knew she grew up in Queens, but there's nothing about her family and beyond that. Um, this is, I mean, I know Soutine was a big uh, personality for her, as he was for de Kooning and, and Pollock. But um, in a woman's hands, this means something very, very different. And um, uh, I mean, it was next to impossible to try to become a, to be out there with your work, which is another reason why per perhaps these paintings were never shown. Um, she may have thought of them as part of, who knows, a uh, part of a development going someplace else. I see them as being perfect in themselves, I see, I, I mean, I, I keep looking at this partly because I'm sitting here and partly because I remember it so well from the moment I walked into this space uh, and how really exquisite it is. Um, it's just, you know, it's just the most beautiful piece of painting that I've seen in a long time. Um, and equally as good as any of the men that were painting at that moment. But she wasn't about to get, have a career um, that they had the possibility of, even though they were immigrants and they had no money. And I mean, men could do the kinds of work that women couldn't do. I mean, when I was at, working my way through the, my art, being in New York, I was doing proofreading. My friend Bianca and I shared a proofreading uh, 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 cubicle. Um, and it was much more demeaning work than the kind of work that de Kooning had, you know, did and other people did. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm rambling quite a bit about this, but um, that, that's a story. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Karen, I wonder if you um, could speak a little about um, how you see this work uh, uh, in relationship to uh, other work by other painters in New York in the 50s and work that we that we are more familiar with work that is already in the history books that's in the canon but um, do you there are things that are very familiar in some ways with this work but I think it also seems to be uh, coming from an individual voice and I just wonder how this how that work strikes you historically speaking I, I'm very glad you asked that. 
because uh, the, the first thing that hit me when I first came to see the show um, was exactly what Louisa said, how much of the moment it seemed, and at the same time, how absolutely individual. Because, um, I mean, I, I was not functioning as an art historian or an art critic or even as a high school student at this period, but I've spent a lot of time looking at it and, and, and was lucky enough to meet some of the people who were, who were working at that time. And you, it's an absolute cliche to say that, but also quite true to say that you know, everybody wanted to be de Kooning. Um, de Kooning was well aware of it. He was, he was uh, apparently quite witty about it and, and used to be uh, pleased that he wasn't going to be the one painting his own worst paintings. But the extraordinary thing about this is that here is Pat, who actually worked closely with de Kooning, who was in a, uh, a, a relationship in, to his work that most of these other people did not have. And yet the striking thing about this work is how personal it is. I mean, there's a, one beautiful little painting in the back, and then Jeffrey sent some images of uh, work that made it really very clear that she could do awfully good de Kooning's if she wanted to. But she didn't. She was uh, fighting for her own voice in a, within the language of gestural abstract expressionism. Now, Pat and Helen Frankenthaler were exact co-evils. Um, could not have been more different in terms of their formations or, or, or anything else. Um, but, uh, you know, Helen came out of Bennington in 49, which is exactly the moment that Pat is in New York. And uh, you see, in, uh, there was that wonderful um, Frank Thaw in the 50s show that John Elderfield did um, last year. Was it last year or the year before? Anyway, uh, you could see that she was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with de Kooning and Gorky and Pollock and everybody else she admired, um, often in the same painting, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they're, they're fearless. Um, and, and out of this uh, sort of amalgam, uh, trying to find her own voice, which she did. I mean, they kept coming out, Frankenthaler. But Pat, it, you never have a sense in these paintings that Pat is tackling another person in the same way. They, they strike me as, as extraordinarily personal and, and original paintings. Um, and in fact, uh, this one seems to point ahead to you know, the next 40 years um, in, in many ways, in, in the touch and in the palette and, and in this, this sense of an underlying structure that, that she's responding to. So uh, I, I find these um, enormously exciting because of that thing that seemed to be impossible for a lot of young artists, which was to uh, to use this very well-established language and make it something that didn't look like imitation to Um <clears throat> Thanks, Karen. Uh, um, speaking of the next 40 years uh, following this the work in this show. Um, Michael, I know that you've been uh, uh, engaged with and interested in, appreciative of uh, Pat's later work, and um, I wonder if you could just share with us a little your sense of her overall development or how she kind of moved through her career and her life and her, and her work as, as an artist over time. Uh, is that something you could say a few words about? Oh, yes. Thank you. I will admit to being very much a, a Johnny-come-lately when it comes to Pat's work. Uh, I, and I will admit that the first time in, included uh, Resnick in an exhibition here in New York, thematic exhibition entitled uh, In the Realm of uh, the Monochromatic, uh, he was present, and I continued to follow his work. Uh, and uh, I can say with, with uh, a degree of embarrassment and certainly some sense of loss that it, it was quite some time before I really began to study Pat's work and, and appreciate it. Uh, the only time I ever included her in an exhibition 
and uh, by an odd coincidence, this was a show that I was invited to do. I was invited to do an exhibition for the Painting Center, uh, the subject of my own choosing, and I did a, an exhibition called a Painting a Passionate Response, and by a lovely uh, uh, coincidence, uh, Louise was also in, in that show, and I was looking for uh, artists based here in New York. They were all, there were about 21 artists, including uh, four deceased artists to whom I dedicated the show. They were Krasner Mitchell, the collage artist Anne Ryan, and uh, to stop and think, forgive me who the fourth person was, but all, all, de all deceased. Um, and uh, I've always been interested in the process, looking at it from what I call the other side of the easel as, as, a, um, as a gallery director and uh, uh, you know, independent curator in more recent years, how artists go about uh, finding and, and nurturing their own voice. I'm very touched that all of you speak of how what an inde independent, that she already was her own person in this body of work. And I'm struck by how fresh it is. Uh, I have to say for myself personally, over the years I've developed a specific uh, interest, a very intense interest in, in work that has an all over structure. It's something that I hope before I kick the bucket to, to do a very ambitious show of, of the many artists. You know, you know, there are many, many people who come to mind, not notably Pollock, in a way almost archetypal. And I was uh, thinking that, that despite the uh, tutelage, I think was the word, that, Karen, that you, that you used possibly. Um, I didn't, Or was it David Cohen? <laughs> David Cohen. Despite her well-documented relationship, student and master with de Kooning, I find in, in certain ways, um, something that she seems to me to, to have discovered over the years, slowly but surely, there's no one strong example of it in this early body of work, is the beauty and the, the, um, the openness of, of using of parallel lines as one's uh, image. One of her most beautiful paintings uh, was a, a series of work, uh, the, uh, the exhibition that, that uh, in 2000 that Karen wrote a very perceptive and touching essay on. Uh, odd, oddly, she was speaking about the relationship between her music and dance, and I know that she was a frequent, uh, uh, she studied at Tai Chi, and when the uh, critic David Cohen said to her, tell me the relationship, do you find this going to Sarah Delano Roosevelt Park on the Lower East Side from her nearby synagogue studio slash home, uh, I guess on a daily basis. He said, do you find that the, the rhythm, the discipline of Tai Chi aids you in the studio? And she said, conversely, she said, to the degree that I feel I've gotten anywhere in working in Tai Chi, she said, it's just the opposite. She said, I feel it's the physical activity and the focus I have over paint of all these years in the studio that have served me as a student of Tai Chi. Um, but it's interesting that they, that, that, uh, that in an exhibition where Karen speaks about the references to dance, she spoke of a, of a motion, which I found very, very moving um, uh, in dance, specifically in classical ballet, where in making a dramatic gestural leap the greatest ballerinas, uh, uh, Pat said, you know, you're either, you either have that ability or don't have it, to suspend someone, even if it's for an instant. You, it's not like, you know, the body is obeying, you know, a, a gravity. There's a sense that just for this instant, of, crucial instant of time, that one is suspended. And that was something that she hoped for uh, in, in her own work. Uh, she speaks about, uh, you mentioned the three three words she spoke of movement, speed, and stillness mm -hmm. as as uh, the to her and you said these are these are the key words in this statement about what she wanted, what she was trying to create. Um, and there are a lot of dichotomies in, in, in the work. 
uh, she she also spoke you quoted her as uh, saying um, uh, thinking with a brush in other words she said, she, paint, she said painting was thinking with a brush and for me she said it was and she said later I think in that beautiful essay she said for me to be able to make a stroke you know on the in the arena of the canvas and immediately see my thinking process take physical form but she said it's as much as one could hope for you know as a yeah, working that's, artist. I'd like to uh, think maybe I've wanted to ask Jeffrey a question. Yeah, um, it wasn't a question. Or, oh. <laughs> it's just two things that occurred to me. First of all, she said the brush is the finger of your brain. She felt it was the physical extension of your mind at work. The, the point well, whether point you're using a flat or a round, you know, it doesn't matter, but you know what they <laughs> at the point where you touch the canvas, your mind has to be behind behind the brush. Uh, and you know, a lot of popular misconceptions about this way of work is that it this type of work is that it's done in some sort of frenzy. Uh, and, uh, we know who we have to thank for that. Yes, we do. <laughs> uh, the other thing about the dance is, uh, oh, and I think I may have lost my chain of thought because two things that occurred. Oh, yes. Uh, you know, she was always against the idea of art as communication. So was Milton. Um, and, you know, they made a very clear distinction between expression and communication. But uh, she, she used dance in that capacity. She says, the dancer doesn't dance to you. He dances, or she is the case, maybe he dances for you. And what she meant is, is, is that, so at that leap that we're talking about, that suspension, that the audience, the dancer is doing it because the audience can't do it. The audience is, dan is leaping with the dancer. That's what she meant by for you. And so, uh, so that's that, that lift. You feel it within yourself. You, you can't actually execute it, but you can feel it. And that's, uh, to her, that was not communication. That was something else. The dancer dances for you, not to you. And it just occurred to me when you were talking about dance, so I thought I'd throw that in. Uh, uh, not, not to divert this to, to a dance discussion, but um, one of the things that, that uh, created a real connection between uh, Pat and me when we first met was the fact that we had both uh, studied at the School of American Ballet, at Balanchine School. Uh, she, she briefly, I was really more th because of her sister, who was also a dancer. Um, but one of the things that is so fundamental to uh, Balanchine technique is the idea that it is not communication. It, 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 it is uh, a, a very three-dimensional expression. And uh, th we did talk about this, and we, we used to uh, remember the uh, talk about the, the Balanchine uh, dictum, don't think, darling, just do. <laughs> and right. that was very much um, a, a paradox, because as you say, um, you know, Pat, Pat did uh, say that uh, painting for her was thinking with a brush. And she did go on to say that, that this was uh, allowing her to see her thoughts in an instant, which she found very, very exciting. But it was not the kind of uh, storytelling thinking that yeah. would go along with communication. Yeah. Um. I think that whole idea of thinking with the brush is, uh, it may sound a little old hat at this point, but at that time, you know, for instance, Gorky, who had just died that very summer that Pat came back, you know, Gorky, for most of his life, made a big point out of the fact that he was making sketches for his paintings and drawings, and that the paintings were, were being transferred, they were transferred, that, that there was a, a considered, uh, the, um, he felt he was being responsible, you know, by having drawings and, and preparation, and uh, that he wasn't, in fact, winging it. Then after the war, he started to change a bit, and then you know he uh, he started you know he told de Kooning and Milton uh, Resnick at the park. He said they had complimented him on his 46 show, his show in 46, and he said 
I did something different. As soon as I was about to make a mark, I put it in the wrong place. <laughs> you know, so it means, it, you can interpret that as meaning no sketch, no prep, you know, but there's, in other words, and it always looked better. Of course, what are you comparing it to? You didn't make the original one, but the point is made, you know, that, that you're not being responsible in that sense. You're being more of an observer than, than, a, than an engineer, you know, you're, you're responding to something that you've just done, and then that's going to perhaps lead to the next stroke, to the next. So it becomes this very plastic uh, development that is not premeditated. And that became very big, I think, and that, that's a very big characteristic of that way of painting. And um, so anyway, so I just gave that. Oh. <laughs> All right, well, no. Um, the, uh, so uh, it was a certainly challenge, I think, for a lot of painters of coming out of uh, the 50s, coming out of 10th Street, coming out of abstract expressionism to how to uh, negotiate or deal with the changing uh, fashions and styles and developments in, uh, in art in post from minimalism and pop uh, through the last 40 years. And I think that uh, one of the things, I guess, that even though your work is quite different, but that you and uh, Louise, that you and Pat share is, a, is an ongoing, continued commitment to, uh, to abstraction, uh, to, to a certain kind of very physical, very um, present, uh, painting, and I just wondered if you could say something about that. You know, what, 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 are, what does it take to um, remain true to a vision over a long period of changing styles and changing structures? Oh, there's probably a million answers to that question, but um, you know, that period, well, first of all, when I went to graduate school, I went out making gestural paintings. <clears throat> when I got there, I went to see um, the Al Held show at the, or at the Chicago Art Institute, and he was doing, he was beginning to do these very hard edge kind of paintings, the early ones. And I went back, and all the the graduate students, there were, I don't know, 20 of us, started comparing notes. And there was this sense that you couldn't make a free mark anymore, that you couldn't, that that was passe. And um, what I started to do is hard edge paintings. I mean, what interested me at that moment was sculpture, was um, Saul Witt, and um, not Sarah, but um, uh, a number of uh, Tony Smith. And so I hooked into the grid, well first into the hard edge and then the grid. Um, and there was a moment when it seemed like there was no turning back from that. Um, and what did turn me around and where I had a tremendous um, kick in the ass was from the women's movement and the lesbian movement that I was very involved with. And what happened in my um, sort of a revolution uh, in my work, in my brain, in my life, in every way, was um, I knew I could do anything I wanted. And instead of doing large paintings that were hard to find a place to store, and um, uh, pieces that I thought were appropriate at the moment. I did exactly what I wanted. I cut the paintings up, I, re re I stitched them together. I, anyway, so I had a, a kind of privilege in a way that Pat didn't have at that moment. Um, and I gradually just worked my way back to making paintings. Uh, and to thinking about the most basic things that had been my initial, the initial impetus 
for this sort of athletic and um, sort of Russian Jewish uh, connection to the brush and making marks and um, there's so many things to talk about here. Yes. It's hard to actually, um, you know, separate it out. But but I but I think but it was really hard that those moments uh, during that period where, I mean, I remember some artist who was showing with Paula Cooper, the guy who did the dreams, and he numbered all his pieces, I can't think Jonathan of Jonathan Brodsky. Yeah, he came to my studio, and I was doing the, at that time I was doing these grid paintings, and he said, oh, well, you know, painting is dead, but these are the only kind of paintings that one can do now. <laughs> and I thought, oh. Oh, well, good for me, you know, but it was <laughs> 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 um, Jeffrey, you uh, made an observation in an email, which I thought was interesting, looking kind of more technically at aspects of these paintings, and you said how for uh, Pat, the picture plane was always very important, and that she made this distinction between the, it uh, was, was very aware of the distinction between the picture plane and the physical surface of the painting, um, which I think that uh, is interesting because one is, a, you know, goes against some sort of superficial cliched ideas of, of, of abstract expressionism, but also speaks to this uh, back and forth in her work in the 50s between representational rep representational space, between objects which are almost recognizable, if not sometimes recognizable or, or evocative of, of things in the world, with the with the very physical gesture, and so I, I I'm assuming that that's something that she spoke to you about in, in general about this idea of the picture plane. Um, well, I think. For her and for de Kooning and for Milton and for that whole group, uh, they didn't have any concept really of painting without the picture plane. For them, the picture plane was one of was the, the rigorous part of painting, uh, and um, and it was something that you. She used the word consolidate, okay, but. Um, I think it's not a question so much of whether you can recognize something or not. And, um, you know, one of the things that bothered her about Bill's work were the, the eyes and the vaginas and all that stuff. She thought it was real cornball and, and actually a kind of um, about a, to try and get the public interested in what he was doing, you know, to get the women in there. I don't know whether that's really true, because he was always interested in that, even way before he knew Pat. You know, he would go back and forth. You know, those women appear every, you know, in and out for all that. But um, but a lot of it had to do, I think, with, with just that you were abandoning the, certain, the conditions of representation. It wasn't so much whether you recognized something. It was all the other stuff. It was gravity, the horizon line, the pull of the horizon line. The, uh, the picture plane, in the in the classic sense of the world, were the way it was taught to me at Cooper Union. You know that it's a pane of glass, or and that when you know when when things go back, if they're below your eye line, they go up on the pane of glass. You know the only way you can show things going back is to go up. That kind of idea, which implies a horizon line, whether you can see the horizon line or not. You know, even if you're doing an interior. So uh, all of that out the window, out the window, including superimposition of forms, you know, something blocking something else so that you, won't, you, you, you see it and then something's in front of it and then it reappears exactly where it's supposed to appear. Out, uh, modeling, relief, you know, relievo, the class, you know, uh, directional light, gravity, you know, all that stuff out. Well, if you're throwing all that out and a lot of people want to, wanted to bring it back in again, what do you have left, you know, I mean, what do you have left? And the picture plane, which is uh, has to also is connected, by the way, with the non-hierarchical structure. You know, um, I mean that it is connected with that with that concept because it's not only something. 
in which uh, whatever forms that you have conjoin but do not, they, they, everything participates actively to a more or less equally equal degree, but you also, and this was important to her, that it expands. And as it expands, it, it goes right to the frame and, and rips it. That it, you expand, like, like blowing up a balloon, or Klein would use that idea of stuffing a mattress, but whatever you want to call it, it expands, and then when you get to the edge, you hold it. Like, and that's the lesson of Cezanne, as far as she was concerned. And that was one of the things that she felt cubism, and not only her, but everybody back then was said that cubism is, doesn't get to the edge. You know, it was a vignette. The activity is basically in the middle, and then when they get to the edge, even people like Leger, it kind of fades away. You know? And they were, you know, so they want, that's also part of it, which we haven't even discussed. How do you move beyond cubism? Because that was, that was part of it. So the only thing I want to say before I hand it back is that, in my view, every artist, and Louise, this has to do with what Louise is saying, you know, you plant, you come into a situation that's not of your own, you know, it's the situation when you're young and you've been introduced to art, and you send out those roots, and the roots go out to the people of your generation, or maybe, you know, whatever, people that you know, people who are doing something. That's true, but there's also, for a really significant artist, there's a tap root, and that goes straight down, and it's very deep, and you're tapping into something that has to do with what you really think painting is all about in a, in a primal sense. And that connects you to the world of art going right back to the caves, really. And, uh, and, and, and artists, I think, who are important, at least to me, have both ideas, both of that. It's not just what's being done now, uh, but also how does, what is painting to you? That's really it. What is it to you as an activity? Why are you spreading this color around on, on a surface? What, what is that about? And, and that's something you can only decide within yourself, really. Raphael, I, I read recently that uh, uh, Mata, when he was living in New York, acted as a sort of coming off squeeze to a number of, of young uh, painters, uh, including uh, Pollock. And that wasn't true in his own work. He's known to have said to them, think about getting to a point where the paint that you're using, oil paint, enamel, has an independent life of its own and try, if you can, when you join it, to, to use the least amount of governance over it. He said that wasn't true in his own work, but I think Pollock apparently was uh, in, influenced by that. And then in the same article, it quoted Pollock as saying that in a really fine, successful painting, the viewers, the viewer's gaze, can enter at any point, any chosen point within the painting. This, of course, touches on work of an all over structure and, and leave, you know, you can leave, you don't have to, you know, enter, you know, into the center. Uh, so I'm wondering how um, the four of you, uh, one working art, two, forgive me, two working artists and then two very distinguished uh, long-term uh, observers and writers about art, how would you square the remark about Pat saying that the uh, Paintbrush, did you say, was like the finger of the brain? In other words, that sense of control. How would you compare that with that idea, you know, of, of, of Montes as it affected color? You know? I'm, I'm very reluctant to compare Pat's idea with Mata's, the way Mata might have affected Pollock. I mean, it's too many steps away for, for me. I can't think that way. But I did think of something that, that Pat talked about, and that was the way space had changed after Cezanne, uh, where she talked about conventional space being uh, about going in. And she said after Cezanne, everything went sideways, which I think is related to what you were saying about things moving across and, and grabbing the, um, the edge of the uh, frame. But it was definitely a... Uh, a way of thinking about about space and thinking about uh, how paint goes on to the to the surface yeah. that was uh, very very much in 
part of, of the way she was thinking. She, she talked about how space expanded. Uh, she talked about, uh, one of the analogies she used was a, a fan that was opened up. That was great. Yeah. And that uh, it still had the folds, but now it was open. So nothing there was, was hidden. There were, yeah. no, nothing was hidden. It still had the memory of a, another mm -hmm. situation. And that, that really stuck with me. It's a beautiful concept. Yeah. Yeah, I've never heard that the fan analogy uh, from anybody else. I think she may she that she may have originated that. I, I never. I, I suspect she did. I haven't come across it in anyone and else. Any, anybody else. And that includes people who painted on fans. Um, <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. But something that that Louise has touched on, and and um, I mean, you guys are forgiven for not thinking about it, but. Um, Think about what it meant to be a young woman wanting to make significant art in the early 50s. I mean, the, the, the leading painters were the most chest-beating, self-regarding group of alpha males you can think of. And, you know, to, to have a studio of your own, to be working the way she was working, much less having gone to Black Mountain in the first place, um, that was that was courageous and it was not typical. And that I think that gutsiness is in these paintings. What's always struck me as odd is how many of the uh, I was mentioning earlier how extremely difficult it is for artists to find. Uh, their own voice, you know, as, as to develop and, and maintain and, and have it grow and, 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 and widen. Um, but uh, an, an aspect of that is, is uh, having uh, allies, having, a, you know, a critic who is supportive. But I've always thought of so many of the famous dealers of that time, Peggy Guggenheim, the legendary Betty Parsons, uh, who, like uh, our, our host, who has brought us all together, the wonderful Elizabeth Harris, she herself, she herself was a, was a pain. But I'm thinking of Martha Jackson and so many others. I thought, you know, as a, as a youngster getting to know the history of American art, I thought, well, where were these women? You know, why were they not showing? Why were not they, they showing? I don't think they showed women artists. artists of their, I don't think the women their women their show women artists. Uh -huh. really, um, that's one of the, uh -huh. the aspects of it. And but I also just wanted to say, back to Elizabeth briefly, that I think the art world, as we all know, has, A, it has a very short memory. Um, and you think of artists, I mean, I can think, you know, in recent years, I don't mean to single out just this one person, but someone with a very finely tuned mind who not only made admired abstract paintings but wrote cogently, I believe for art form primarily, is the uh, uh, Walter Darby Bannard. I mean, when is the last time you heard an argument or uh, somebody you know, avidly discussing his work? So it's, it's mm -hmm. easy for artists to be forgotten. Well, he's had a number of very good shows in the last five years. Yes, but he's not completely forgotten. But it's so, it's just so, it's so difficult, you know, for artists. And I think to have an ally of a, of a dealer, this, if I'm not mistaken, is, is the, the seventh exhibition that is listed this mountain. Go ahead. I was actually thinking of maybe opening this up to, uh, to the say, audience. But one thing. Um, so, yeah, I think the thing about Pat being a woman, it, and also that she's younger. And so you're with a bunch of guys, uh, not 100% guys. I mean, there's people like Mercedes Matter and Elaine Cooning around. Uh, big personalities, by the way, and also uh, a bit older than Pat. Pat. Um, so there is that, that aspect that you're not only a woman, but you're also younger, they're older, they're more experienced, they've had experiences that you haven't. You've come from Queens a middle-class Jewish family and uh, with the conventional upbringing. Um, and these guys went through the Depression. I mean, they were, they were survivalists. 
Um, but for her, I think the only analogy I can really come with is it's like running off to the circus. You know, it's like that's really what it was for her. Because, you know, uh, I got in touch, I found all these love letters from some guy, 50 love letters. And so I decided to Google him. And this is from 1947, 46. And I figured, well, maybe he's alive, you know? Turns out he was alive. He's a retired professor of comparative literature at USC. And I won't say his name, but, uh, but I, I got in touch with him and I said, I've got all these letters here for these, you know, and they're not uh, from you. They're all letters from him to her. I said, do you have any letters from her to, to you? And he said, no, she didn't write me. She, <laughs> says, <laughs> she said she was, she, she, she said she was, she was cold and this and that, you know, but, but you can see he was absolutely enthralled with her. So I said, so what, uh, what happened, but, you know, how did it end? So he says, well, she, she went down a black mountain. She said, I'm going down a black mountain. And that was the end of everything. You never saw her again. That was, you know, it was like, that was it. That was it. And uh, I don't know whether Pat's sister is here. Is Eileen here? I, Eileen? No? OK. Eileen, by the way, is Eileen Pazloff. She's a very well-known dancer and, uh, and the head of her own company for many years. Uh, she was a real. She was a professional dancer, but she said, I, "You know, I, I was interviewing her and I was asking her also about that. And the same thing. She said, well, we were close and this and that, and we're sisters. And I was a little bit younger, and I really looked up to her. And then she said, I'm going down a black mountain for two months. And she said, and that, you know, and that, you know, just separated us. And it was that it was just this big. You know, so it really was a little bit like, you know." being, r running off to the circus. It was like, I'm not coming, goodbye everybody. You know, this is it for me. So, you know, uh, there was it, it was, it was an incredibly dramatic and delightful time for her. I don't think she felt, oh, those horrible men, what are they, you know, she, I don't, she never talked about it like it was oppressive. No, no, no I'm, but, I'm, I'm not right. in that relationship. I'm just. I'm, they were big personalities and she very. Was, she yeah. was playing. She wanted to play with the big boys. She and did. She did. She did. Yeah. Well, you know, she was there before the club. She was at the Waldorf, and she helped to make the club. You know, but they wouldn't let her join. I don't know how pe many people know this. Uh, the women weren't allowed in until uh, probably about six months later. And the reason why they were let in is because it was kind of boring without them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But originally, the original idea in the club was no women, no homosexuals, and no communists. The last was the most ironic, because ironic, most of them were former communists, so I have no idea. But they were terrified of McCarthy, and they were terrified of, of the government coming in and seeing them as some sort of radical revolutionary you know, group with political leanings. So they wanted to do that, too. But then, you know, uh, they said, well, we're, you know, where are the women? You know, well, so it didn't last very long, but, uh, but that was the, an, an initial thing. It was going to be a boys club. Uh, but they did want the women on Saturday because every Saturday was a dance, and they weren't going to dance with each other. So. Um, that, that sounds about right yeah. for what women were doing. Um, I think that we make light of the fact that women had an impossible time. Uh, during that period, and till the present moment, a, a very difficult time. Um, I went to, I mean, this uh, a little vignette. Uh, I was uh, in school in Philadelphia in the 50s, and I would go to New York by bus, and I would, uh, you know, look at some shows and um, buy some art supplies. And one day, I went and I bought some rice paper. I hope it's okay to tell this story. And um, I went to the Cedar Bar with my friend. Uh, and I walked in and I passed a table with, jo I mean, I knew what these people looked like because they were all in our news. Joan Mitchell, um, uh, it's funny, I can't think of his name. Pazlov's husband. <laughs> Milton. Yes, Milton. Milton was sitting on the edge and they were about, maybe four or five others in this booth. 
And I had a rolled up package of, of rice paper and I sat down and we had a couple drinks and Milton Resnick went like this to me. And I thought, and I thought at that time that I was going to get to New York and I was going to be friends with these guys and I would be part of this community. Well, uh, I went up and he said to me, um, they were all looking at me, and he said, I was probably 18, maybe. Um, so what do you, what, kind, what is that in that roll? And I said, it's rice paper. Oh, what do you do with rice paper? I, I mean, I think this story actually tells you a lot about what Pat dealt with. Um, and I knew he knew what rice paper was used for. I said, I'm making woodcuts. <laughs> And then he went like this, and he motioned for me to sit on his lap. <laughs> and I took a look at that group, and I turned around, and I walked back to my seat, and I thought, that's it. Now I know what it is that I'm not going to get, and how I'm going to have to fight to make my paintings and to do my work. And I never expected to show. I didn't even expect that I'd be able to teach. I just wanted to paint. Um, I have, there are many examples of women who drank themselves to death. I mean, the, our history is rife with disasters. My aunt, um, Razel Kapustin, who studied with Sikeros and told me abstraction was terrible and I pretended I wasn't doing abstract painting. Um, and she told my mother, who was a painter, to study with, with Hans Hoffman. My mother couldn't leave the family. My mother's a very good painter, too. So it's like, there's like, um, a, a corpses. I mean, I, I'm, I'm trying not to make this sound really awful, but it is kind of awful what happened to women. Joan Mitchell, I knew her very well, and I, could, I watched you know, I mean, she made great paintings, and um, I watched a disaster unfold, you know, a personal disaster. There were a lot of personal disasters, but there were a lot of, they weren't just women. Well, yeah, I mean, but look disastrous. at Dorky and blah, 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 but <coughs> the, the point is that they still could belong to the club in a way that women couldn't. They, w they may have been let in as part dancing girls, as you're suggesting. <laughs> but, no, they were but you, later. It wasn't that much later well, that they were members. Well, you know, and I think, um, I don't want to <clears throat> monopolize this too much, but uh, just a little bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, <laughs> you know, gave uh, DeSouvero a chance to have a show at the Green Gallery. And, um, you know, because she took care of him and helped him when he had his accident. Uh, he put a painting of hers, as I was telling you earlier, on one wall in his first show at the Green Gallery. And probably that was the last time in a long time, you know, uh, that, that a really significant um, space was um, allowed, a, a woman's work was allowed to be there and shine. Those are exactly the reasons why shows like this are so important and, and why there's so much uh, unwritten history. So many of those kind of silenced and, and marginalized uh, lives and, and oeuvres. And, and I think that that's, you know, on the one hand, we can be uh, you know, thankful and, and excited and, and filled with aesthetic pleasure at looking at these paintings. But it's also, as you're reminding us, that there's, there's a history uh, with certainly dark sides and, and an ongoing legacy that needs to be uh, addressed. So um, anyway, still much more to say, but I'd just like to see if anyone has any comments or questions. Uh, what, we try to... Elizabeth. The reason Pat was not that well known in the 50s, because he was living in Boston, because she was less well known than the other woman artists in the pictures. You know, it was always him first. And I don't know why, she, I never understood why she felt the need to do that. Um, I, I was, I've been hesitating to tell this story, but thank you for bringing this up. Um, Pat had a Guggenheim. 
which uh, came fairly late in her life. And it's always a pleasure when those awards go to people who really deserve them. Um, I congratulated her on this and said what a wonderful thing it was. And she said, oh, it should have been Milton. <laughs> Um, Ebola, first of all. Uh, everybody? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the Cedar Bar, okay? Uh, you have to say that these guys from the 30s had to fight being sissies in America, okay? To be an honest or intellectual poet was to be a sissy. And a lot of that drunkenness was kind of a stupid scene, a horrible scene that came out of being masculine, an idea of being masculine. Okay. Um, I had a talk with uh, Pat one time, and I, I complimented her on the space in her, in her uh, a recent show she had had. And she said, there is no space in painting. You know, very <laughs> Pat way. You know, there is no space in painting. And uh, end of the conversation. And anything I tried to say was really just chopped off. <laughs> uh, now, the, the same thing when you talk about communication, you talk about an aspect of communication, maybe sending a message, telling a story, but not commune. Not what I mean, art would be nothing if there wasn't communication. The most, you know, the most abstract art, uh, the, 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 you know, as as deep into the, into the individual uh, artist as possible. It has to communicate. It has to be a point of commune. Can't argue with that. Uh, uh, anyone else? Uh, in the back? I just want to say it's a great time. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say something? <laughs> yeah, I, I had, I've had talks with, with Milton and Pat about that. Because I was, the first time they said art is not communication, I must have been, I don't know, 22 years old or something. I said, how can you say that? And, um, and I think you know their feeling is is that uh, to communicate with somebody you need some sort of calculation of who you're talking to. You know you don't you don't talk about small particle physics with an eight year old. You don't talk <laughs> you don't talk French with someone who you know doesn't speak French. You know so you so it it kind of means that you have to have some concept of of who you're communicating with. And for them that was. That was a no-no. They associated that really with people like Ronald Reagan, you know, who knows exactly who he's talking to. And, and, and not only the words he used, but also what he doesn't say. The subtext of what, of what, you know, well, we're all familiar with political talk. It's not only the words that are being used, but also the subtext uh, of what's being said. And that communicates to the base. We all know what a base is. So it was, they thought of communication as a very political way of, of thinking, and they felt it had no place in art, and uh, and so I'm just explaining the way they thought about it, and the, the the thing about space, it meant room, it meant imaginative projection. If you can project imaginatively project yourself into a painting, and imagine walking around and you know patting Jesus on the shoulder and saying "poor boy," and looking you know going on. In other words. That was out, and that's what space, when they say no, when, if she said that, I'm sure she did, but you know, that's what it meant, no, no room. You can't, you can't imaginatively project yourself into a Cezanne. That's why, that's one of the great things about Cezanne, you know, is that you can't walk around in it. It, it doesn't mean it's not spatial. It's spatial, it's not flat but it doesn't have that room and air where you can go here and there, like in a classical painting, where you can imaginatively walk around and get to the other side of the, of the desk, not just this side, but go around to the other side. You know? Yeah, it's like, it's like you only see half of, any, of everything. You know, it's like, uh, like if, if, I, if I show you a ball or an orange, you can only see 50%. So the 50% you can't see doesn't count. It's not part of art. Only the 50% you can see. And there's no way to overcome it. You can run around the orange as fast as you want. You can throw it up in the air. You're only going to see half. It's like a condition of life. You know. I so think there's another, uh, another question or comment. Yeah? Yeah, I don't quite understand I'm sitting amongst her paintings. And we've been talking for, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half. And I mean, the color. 
is incredible in her work. And I don't see anyone addressing what did she say or think about color or... Good paint. I mean, uh, she went to the you know, we're talking about space in a kind of general abstract way. Yeah. And you look around the room and there's light and color and, mm -hmm. and this is a major aspect of her work. Yeah. And why aren't we <laughs> noticing it? Well. You know, a lot of those guys in 1949, 1949, 1950, they weren't getting their their oil paint in the art store. They couldn't no, 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 afford it. I'm not talking about guys. I'm talking about us. Wait, here. wait. We're I, but I'm getting to what you're saying. Uh, they used, and you know, they, they went to the hardware store for their paint. So you know, they they buy Ronan's drop black and Balin's white, which turned brown. That's why all those clines yeah, are now brown. No, we're talking about. Because she went to the art store. Because she had she had a job. No, she, I think that no, she, I think the issue is issues. why they're not addressing I'm not the talking color about the paint, paint or anyone with paint. That's not the point of the panel. Well, you can't make these paintings without cadmium. Kind of Look at that cadmium. They're about color without mentioning color. I don't think these colors, these paintings are primarily about color. Well, well they're about colors not used in a structural way. Right? Well, I think that um, you, you can't, you, you, you're right, okay, uh, back again. I love the way you're talking about the word communication. It seems to me that in their disdain of whatever they thought was communication exactly at that time, they created another form of communication which is just through the paint. I mean, this paint communicates with me at gun level. And, you know, when I, when I look at uh, calligraphy, you can read the soul of the painter, whether it be a Chinese painter from 500 years ago, or Kuming, or, or this painter, or anyone. I mean, paint has a way that it communicates, and, uh, by its body, by its color, by its, by its use, that is transcends uh, verbal communication, specific uh, communication, and that's what's beautiful about painting. Now, now that they rejected that kind of communication, they found a new kind of communication. Uh, thank you. Say something. Which is, I mean, the whole idea of just going back and forth with communication. Don't you think that uh, <clears throat> any painting that's, that's has any significance, don't you think it's, it has essentially a conversation <clears throat> that goes on, a pictorial conversation, rather than the word communicate? If there's a conversation, there seems to be some sort of interaction between the viewer and the artist and the work. So I don't see how it's possible for you to make a, an, an art object without it having some sort of connection, whether you want to call it communication or conversation. I would prefer to call it conversation because I don't see how you can get around with it if you're making something plastic and, it's, and it has any sort of humanity in it, then it has to have some sort of connection. So the whole idea of not communicating just doesn't seem to make sense to me. It does any, would someone else like to speak to this? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, maybe one of the underlying unspoken issues here is the relationship between painting and criticism or painting and how we look at painting and how we talk about painting, and those are, you know, you're actually addressing that. Like, this, this, those are not easy things to do, and I often feel as a critic that the works that I'm most interested in writing about are those that, in the end, escape my best attempts to try to explain them or account for them or describe them or understand them, and it's that there's all, you know, I think in, 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 in successful, important great art it's always it communicates but putting that into kind of more formalized conventional language is 
much more difficult. Impossible. Uh, <laughs> well, they would say, yeah. Uh, in the back, yeah. Um, I just I remember at the issue somewhere, Mr. Dorfman was talking, he was using two different words, communication and expression. Yeah. And along the same conversation that we're having right now, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, did they ever, did Milton and Pat ever talk about how they differentiated between expression and yeah. communication? Because you can express yourself with no one even being around. I mean, that's, that's the point. I mean, you know, you can express yourself in just the way you're walking down a sunny street and feeling the air on your face and people look at you and say, now there's a happy man. You're expressive. You're expressive without, it doesn't mean that you're, you know, communicating means for them, it meant really communicating in the narrow, what many of you I think would call the narrow sense of the word. For the rest, they would call expression or correspondence. Correspondence, which can also be, pronounced co-respondence, you know, to responding, the painter responding and then you responding to what he did or she did. It's not them, it's what they did and the, what they see, why they stopped, why they said this is consummated, I've consummated, that you will see that the way they, maybe not the way they see it, but you'll see why they, why they didn't go further. That's an important, by the way, an important part of, I think, the art experience. I had a teacher, a very good teacher. He said, he taught me aesthetics at the Memphis Academy of Art. I was an undergraduate. He said, I have a question for you, James. If I throw a brick through this window, is that an uh, act of expression? I said, sure. If you throw a brick through the window, he said, no, that's an outburst. So, to get to expression requires something that goes much deeper to me than walking down the street. It, it has something that has to have uh, a certain kind of soul searching. It takes its own form. Uh, it has it has some endurance. It has uh, it's, it's, it comes from experience. It comes from a lot of things. To, to really act out or have an expressive act. And so when he said that I've been wrestling with that the rest of my life, because if you do throw a brick through a window, that really is an expression. That's an outburst. It's a different word. Uh, All right, just I think time yeah. for one. Time for one more, uh, one more in the back. Thanks, Raphael. Um, one of the things that I was impressed with uh, is the fact that you were talking about her coming back on the train from Black Mountain with William de Kooning and she was 20 years old. So most of these paintings are from a 20 year old kid, 20 to 32, something like that. And I was just thinking that despite all of the hard times or the tragedies or whatever of her life, that you have to look at her and realize this is a kid, 20, 22 years old, basically walked in and stayed in this milieu, which is two blocks of East 10th Street which was the center of the art world for about five or six or seven years. She was there. She, she was an integral part of that whole community. It was the Cooney was there, Milton was there, Michael Goldberg was there, Jack uh, Torkov was around the corner. She was there, she held her own. So you really have, and at the age of 20, 25, whatever anybody thought or did or anything else about it, you have to admit, she just, walked in there, walked up, and st stayed there on the top of the mountain for a pretty good amount of time, and then kept going on, because a lot of people probably tried that, wore out after a year or two, and just whatever made her do it, she did it, and, and was part of our history. Yeah. Uh, well, and I think that's a really good point, and, and it's good to remember that all the paintings we're looking at here in the gallery were made by someone in their 20s. And um, so, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming and thank Elizabeth for um, hosting this event and uh, thank the panelists and thank you all.